with this stream yard will probably work well for me and if not i can disappear here and try to come etc but at least the star of the show jackson with his spectacular sheet which i should be able to see when you screen share this time yes yeah that's the hope yeah so hey guys we're back if you, if you actually you saw anything um let me see if i can Yes, I'm not seeing anything on our site. The process of the grand sorting uh, before the show was done, and so I get dressed and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, because when I'm doing my some crap, I'm usually just in my jammies after I get up from bed. All right, all right. Let's back to the game again. Yeah, seeing the beginnings of the screen share. Yay! Today, get rid of yourself. RJ is back with his muffled voice because StreamYard hates him. <laughs> and Jackson is back. <laughs> Welcome. But OBS hates me, so unfortunately, it's, it's due until I figure it out how to get OBS or StreamYard or, or restream the work on my computer again. But we do know Whoever that Whoever you are, are, some system will hate you, and you will have trouble with it. That's the thing you learn, and you just get her past it. You but know? yes, we are, we are, I definitely, I was taking the YouTube screen, and we're definitely live. Uh, okay, alrighty then. In that case, let hey. me, let's start this up. Okay, yeah, so. Alright, you guys can see it? Yes. Yep. Okay, so RJ, this was. I don't the... know what it was <laughs> we saw before. So here it is. So here's, the, what is. A plant. Is cyanobacteria a plant? Is euglena a plant? Is a diatom a plant? What about kelp or nori or mushroom? Are any of these plants? No, he answered uh, already prepared because no. we already <laughs> knew a bit of that. <laughs> that is correct. The correct answer is no, none of these are plants. I don't um, think... I don't think this screen you you got the the next screen sh sh showing currently. Yeah, you still, you're still on the first. You're on the first title. You're still on the title screen. I'm on the title screen still. Yes. Yep. What? But I'm sharing. Oh, that's so not good. Why? Why is that happening? Can you see it? There you go. Was a plant. Now we're seeing the second part. Yeah, you need to click on that. Yeah. Now the thing okay, that well, that strikes me as I will represent layman here, is that this stuff looks like wiggly green crap. They're all, and except a weird mushroom in there, mushrooms you find in the forest along with all of the definite plants. And then the little stuff in the lower left corner are little tiny things that have things around them and that might or might not be easily confused with plants. Well, I, the I fact know that the most plants not... make pollen and stuff that similarly looks to. I know the mushroom was definitely not a plant, things. and it's closer to us than, than to plants. Yeah, yeah but it, it would be understandable in, in the early times when people went out into the forest, they could see plants and they would see fungi, and it would not be immediately obvious that there was some distinction yeah. between them. Plant stars, yeah, a little wasn't, seed. Wasn't, wasn't plants been originally, thing, and sometimes they wasn't, change over time. And all. Yeah, wasn't plants originally. I mean, I'm plants. Was it mushrooms? Was it with the plants in the first taxonomy stuff? Back well, yeah, back in like the 1500s. Uh, I, uh, I'm not, <laughs> yeah, I, animal, mineral, and vegetable. That surprised me. <laughs> yeah, and yes, it, the rock, the rock. Shocking that that was what they did because as you're looking at appearances. They had no knowledge of what was going on on the inside, and they would carve them up. And if you carved up pieces of plant and carved up pieces of mushroom. <laughs> that seem similar and it really was until the microscope era and then now in the genetics era the microscope expanded things so if you, uh, jackson can confirm that that once they got the microscope in hand they started seeing that things that look kind of plant-like weren't really necessarily at the cellular level but they really kicked in once we could see the genes and then boom that changed systematics completely yeah, it wasn't exactly. Yeah. What is the uh, but off topic? What is the rock kingdom like? <laughs> the mineral kingdom. <laughs> it's just the rock. everything rock. Yeah, just everything rock. That'd be yeah. That 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 that's that's um a, a very strong actor that makes a lot of movies and has a little TV series about his life. That's what that is. 
Okay, can we see this slide? This yes. new slide. <clears throat> okay. So Bingo. So with the with the last slide about what is and is not a plant in mind, I figured it'd be uh, relevant to look at eukaryotes as a whole so we can figure out where plants fit in relation to us and to other organisms. And so, uh, as you can see here, there, there are a couple major groups of organisms. You have amorphia or uniconta, whichever one you want to call it, which is um, animals, fungi, and our relatives like the amoebas. You have the excavata, which are either paraphyletic or polyphyletic, depending on how the genetics eventually shakes out, because that's there's still controversy over that <clears throat> as a result of things like um, horizontal gene transfer and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, and then on the left side of this tree, you have uh, a couple major groups. You have TSAR, which is also called the Chromista group, which, which contains phytoplankton, kelp, um, lots of, of little protists. And then you have Haptista and Cryptista, which are, are a couple little groups. And then you have the Archaeplastids. Archaeplastida is relevant to us. But, but so all eukaryotes are, are cellular organisms that have uh, membrane bound organelles and like a nucleus, and they have mitochondria. That's the major features of eukaryotes. So within the Archaeplastida. Well, uh, go back to that previous thing because I think there's a relevant point. It's on some. Hey, dots exactly. and stuff. Can you, can you Notice a little. Real fast. Can you send Nessie you know, a link? He wants, to, he wants to join. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Remember, as more people join, odds that it will not. Be... So, uh, let's see right. whether or not RJ gets destroyed, uh, Dave. As long as I have the screen. I'll point out that note that no molecular data in 2004, the little black dots that relate to 2004 is now. Seven years ago, so things have changed on a lot of that. But you can see how this chart is reflecting a view that was led by what they knew at the time. Now, a question that immediately jumps out of my quick is that phyta word, P H Y T A. What the? I'll notice that it's in haptophyta and cryptophyta and the uh, rhodophyta and uh, all that. That's about a feature that's being looked at that was or not being regarded as a classification bit. So maybe, if, what do you know about Phyta as a word? Huh. I'm not sure. What do we know about which one? I don't. Yeah, the, the, the little, that little suffix, the Phyta, P-H-Y-T-A. That, that, what does that refer to? Because I honestly don't know. I think it's just, it's, it's a, well, is it plant? Or let's find out. Hold on, let me look it up. Uh, research. So, research. Yeah, that's giving us a clue about why it's popping up in certain contexts and others because you're seeing the three different phyta groups are now showing up genetically very distinct from an evolutionary point of view. Plant, yeah, it's just and plant. That's probably real. Yeah, so, see, it's, so it's stuff plant. that was seen as such initially. Right, and that, that, that rhizaria and all that other stuff that's going on are groups that take on forms looked off but because I think they're completely off on a different sighting. So that, that yeah, that's right. my commentary on that slide. Yeah. Shut him now on to the next. So I, I do have a question though on the that uh, uh, last slide. Um on the eukaryote thing. I know I know the chloroplasts are just in are just in the you plastic one, but are do all of these have mitochondria or only like Yes, they Part don't have mitochondria. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really big feature from which, but effectively, once you started doing symbiosis, you can now connect up systems that couldn't do what they can do to get. Yeah, so no coincidence that organs that start being much more interesting are ones that have made use of that endosymbiotic process. And yeah, the plants kick into the okay, the can anyone hear me? Or the because they yeah. do too. Can anyone okay, hear me? Uh, yep. Hey, hey hello. <laughs> inside them. So, so now we move on to, as you saw. Well, Although, can I, can I make one comment about the uh, mitochondria? Like, they're, they're 
Oh, are you carry mm-hmm. that, that don't have mitochondria, yes, but they like but they, 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 and monosarcomonoides, yes. yes. But by and large, 99.9999% of eukaryotes have but, right. <laughs> mitochondria. But I, I want to, I want to add to to trivia say, if you want, if you, if I want, <laughs> if I can. That, that, that those eukaryotes that lack mitochondria, nobody ever invites them over for parties. Yeah, I don't know if if they lost it or they, oh, they lost it, earlier yeah. brands. Uh, it, it, was, it. it was it was mm-hmm. one, it was once thought that they were like the uh, ancient eukaryote that didn't have the mitochondria, but now mm-hmm. it is recognized that they, they lost the mitochondria and they still have mitochondrial derived organelles like uh, uh, mixosome or how, how is it called again? Uh. The uh, uh, oh, like hydrogenosomes and mitosomes. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, indeed, correct. Uh, so, within the archaeoplastid group, we come to three groups. And this is represented as a polytomy here in this because there is a bit of debate over who nests more closely with who. Uh, well, but the important well, point is... polytomy for, for us word geeks. So, it's not, uh, it's not a, a nested... Uh, like as you see with so with this first one you see how it you have like the branch and then you have you have the split and so you have one branch go off or the two branches go off and then you have another split and another split you have mm-hmm. branches nested within branches they're each sister to each other going down whereas with a polytomy you don't have that you don't know who's sister who is more closely related to who basically it's ah, they're all yeah. closely related okay. but the question is where does the root sit and that's been debated i'm not sure what the exact um yeah. some some say that it's veridi plantain glaucophyta or veridi plantain rotophyta either way i guess is this was, another given, one of these given the throwbacks. nature of how biological semantics works and genetics this doesn't surprise me at all because we're looking at a branching that of uh, what a billion years ago maybe yeah is it another yeah, pretty reason? long time yeah. ago. And another thing what what where uh, we don't know this much about it because they're, they're not they're not us or not they're not animals we, we don't pay much attention to it. So, so uh, a few uh, well, in fairness, I mean there are there is genetic data on it, but this, as RJ said, is an event that occurred so deep in the past that yeah. you're probably going to have some conflicting signals. Uh, because every one of the, of the names that you're seeing at the right side of the side are all existing organisms that live today. Yes. So every one of them is tracing a lineage that goes back so far that there's even a twinkle in the uh, eye of whatever's going on back in that. Yeah, I'm actually or, curious. We, and we Nestle, don't know. Do you know which one is the sister to which? Uh, I've seen, uh, like, I also, I'm looking up some of my up papers that I have saved uh, about e- eukaryote evolution. I've seen very recent papers that put the uh, rhodophytes, the uh, red algae, as mm-hmm. uh, the basal, the first splitting off, and then you get the uh, the green algae and the glaucophytes group okay. together. Yeah. Gotcha. But of okay. course, there are, there are still disagreements the between never be the certain. researchers. Oh. Right, right, yeah. Is whether or not there were branches that were going in the past among common ancestors, some of which led to group lasted for half a billion years very successfully and went extinct so that they would no longer have extant organisms today. That would skew our understanding of that because we would have literally no idea that they ever existed. If you a trace fossil, uh, you would have a thing that lo- looks kind of like something else. And so it Question. would not be able to just hang on inside of their biology. Right. Are yeah. all these right now, all these bran- all these clay branches, whatever here, are we still in the pre uh not on on land stages yet yet? Or well, I mean these are there? just these are all living lineages. Oh, so they, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, these when they trace back to it, I would wager most of them are probably oh, okay. land livers or ones across the boundary. Well, yeah, most of them are aquatic clades, but this and their common ancestor Ooh. would have been an aquatic um, organism. But yeah, these are all the living members. These aren't fossil groups. I don't know if, uh, so I don't know if we're going to get to it later, but do all land plants have one common ancestor? Or is they, they, we do, will get several, to that. Or are there several Ooh, yeah. people? Ah, we will, in fact, get to that. Spoiler. So second symbiotic event with the bacterium is what defines the archaeoplastids as well as a 
there are some other um, cellular um, uh, synapomorphies of this group, but uh, for our audience, we don't really need to go into all that. So we're just so just remember cyanobacterium. That's our major point for these guys. So yep. now we're going down the variety plantae, the green algae. And so the important point here is that they have chlorophylls A and B, which is what causes them to have their green color. And so as you can see here, we have two major branches of variety plantae. We have chlorophyta, uh, which is uh, a bunch of algae, including the group which you see down on the bottom left, the like Volvox and Chlamydomonas. Those are members of chlorophyta. And then you Ooh, have Volvox. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to include that picture because I just love it so much. It's such a really neat little image of, Hello. of uh, multicellularity. Although there are, I think there are some uh... Like uh, one uh, of the more the complex, like the more cellular, like the, it it is it's not that linear, of course. Like maybe maybe it's simplified than uh, in this figure. If I if I remember correctly, like one uh, sixteen cell is more closely related to one four cell than the, it is to the uh, thirty two. Oh, that may be the, uh, that yeah. that may be the case. I'm not entirely sure with this with this particular yeah. image, but yeah, you, you no, have that, to that may be the case. Yeah, I think yeah. I think, no, I think on Wikipedia, on Wikipedia it, is a, is, it uh, shows it more correctly. I think, but anyway, yeah, that, it probably yeah. is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, you're probably right about what that. About but, um, chart is although on the one side the chlorophyta, you've got a, a variety of little things that look like little wiggly things with little fronds sticking out of them that make them move around. Um, but. An awful lot of them, the land plants and uh, bryophytes, I think I just wanted to look up on there. Isn't that stuff up there? Or maybe I'm reading badly. Uh, anyway, well, bryophytes are land plants. See, reminds me oddly of, um, of feather structure. In other words, you have fractal branchings that in this case are allowing for a, a very effective de deployment of those photosynthetic cyanobacteria systems. And why they end up looking like the things that we think of in that because of the dynamics of those chloroplasts. Yeah, yeah. These, um, yeah, with these we have a, um, and that's something we'll get into to shortly. So we're going to talk about how the life cycle changes as we go from more protist-like um, algae to more complex algae and ultimately to land plants. And so that's something we'll discuss shortly. And that's something where... I ha absolutely had to do a slideshow because it's going to be like nearly impossible to discuss yeah. <laughs> without a also, slideshow. Uh, one, one, one interesting yeah. character to note about uh, the, the green, uh, the favorite plant, the plant A, is that like normally in the green algae and also in the cyanobacteria, they have like antenna proteins on top of their like uh, reaction centers in the photosynthesis system. Mm -hmm. And green plants lost that. They, they have no, uh, I think it's called the phylocosome. Okay. If I pronounce correctly, but it's a very interesting thing to note. Oh, yeah, okay. more devolution there, Nest. Exactly, it's all devolution. <laughs> yeah, it's all devolution. Yeah. Oh, by the way, earlier in the, uh, you mentioned it in in our test stream that failed. That that another branch of, of this branch did a double in the symbiosis thing. Yeah. So that's the. Um, oh yeah, the right. double. Oh yeah, yeah. We're pretty sad. Uh, that's juicy piece of information. So the the TSAR group, as well as I believe also the Haptista and the Cryptista groups, they did um, they did another endosymbiotic event. So you had the original endosymbiotic event, which was the origin of eukarya, where you have the engulfment of the bacterium, which eventually became the mitochondria. Then in the archaeoplastid lineage, you had the engulfment of the cyanobacterium that would become the chloroplast. And then in the TSAR lineage, you had them taking over uh, or capturing archaeoplastids like rotophytes, the red algae, and then using that inside of them. So it was you have a, a like a diatom which has the red algae in it, which has the chloroplast and mitochondria in it. So it's like a matryoshka doll. Yeah. And, and and in fact, some lineages yeah. and when even for... yeah. and, oh, and you, because and I, as I, I, recall... one, if, I guess the... <laughs> As I recall, oh, oh, gosh, his name, the 2004 uh, uh, phylum book, uh, Valentine, uh, he, he was knee deep in that. But that recognition that there were tertiary and, and secondary 
endosymbiotic events, where an endosymbiont gets swallowed by another one comes as a unit of symbiotes, just getting hit. Systematics during that in the last 15 years has been sorting all of that out. Yeah, you even have organisms who have things like uh, vestigial nuclei. So you have the remnant of the nucleus oh, yeah. from the, the green algae, and it's still there in the uh, in the, the chromist. And so it's like, it's this is pretty darn good evidence that an endosymbiotic event occurred. Otherwise, yeah. You, yeah. you have to make up some like ridiculous... Or, or you have a designer who's nuts. Yeah, who made yeah separate little like micro nuclei inside of the the organelle, which has its own. An yeah, absent-minded no, it's... designer forget what he does and plops things down and structures. And... Yeah, you get like yeah. yeah, you have to get crazy workarounds for that. And before that we go point. on that, we might and, and there might be another one too, depending if the nuclear the nu of the nucleus was in so big in the symbiotic event or something else entirely. It's also, also interesting to consider that like one of those lineages who got the uh, like the secondary endosymbiosis from the uh, green algae, one of those is malaria, who mm -hmm. lost the photosynthesis system or, or, or the ability to, to photosynthesis. So it's really strange to consider like a like a parasite that lives in our body used to be a plant, basically. Really? <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I did not yeah. know that. The, the, the mosquito carrying malaria is, was yeah. these, these plants. I did the, the, uh, the malaria the so, found a new yeah. environment where it didn't get the equipment. Uh, the other thing that's Plasmodium. intriguing is although yeah. there has been um, an awful lot of which was the organism type or group that led to the mitochondria, uh, probably because it's so far back, there's absolutely no disagreement in the scientific community uh, that it's cyanobacteria that have become the chloroplast in plants. So are, are these yeah. all... Can you still do the uh, what's it called the horizontal gene transfer for stuff, or is it are we past that point by now? We're we're pretty much past that point by now. We're we're dealing. I mean, sure, it it probably st still happens, but I mean, well, you have like horizontal gene transfer, which is what happened with where you have the uh, the endosymbiosis. That's a horizontal gene transfer event, but um, but by and large, we're we're kind of past that point now. So we're dealing mostly with with more of a tree aspect than a bush. The, the, you know, more of a tree of life than a bush of life. And okay. so to get back to the plants, <laughs> we're, we're never going to get through this. So we are back to Veridi Plantae. I'm okay, having so fun, kid. We, so we're looking at Streptophyta. So Streptophyta is what we're concerned with here. And you have this paraphyletic group called the Charophytes, which are, are the closest relatives of the land plants. So we're looking specifically here at the land plants, which is Embryophyta. Now they are called embryophytes in the embryo because they have an embryo. The fertilization occurs in the plant rather than out in the open. They're not just releasing the sperm and egg out into the water. They have a, a an area on them which makes the eggs and then the sperm lands in there and fertilizes it. And that's that area which holds which makes and holds the eggs is called the archegonium. Right, that's the embryo, and so the the zygote okay, which forms know, in there was that more at that stage to how the animals deal with their sex stuff, doing stuff internally than how the evolved derived later plants basically throw their stuff out into the external world and get well, no, they in still an ecological way that. Well, you still do that. They still have the higher plants still have the the archegonium. It's just it's different. It's it's still internal. Hmm. This sort of internal fertilization, but it's in a different way, and and that's all. We're going to talk about all that stuff because that's the the change in the reproductive. Do, yes, the change in the reproductive uh, uh, Jackson, cycle and structure Jackson, is. Do, the, not, do not say do not say higher plants. You will make the the, the charophytes cry. Oh my goodness! I apologize, <laughs> yeah, charophytes. Well, that, yeah, and boy, so, they get really testy. They go on Twitter so, all the time. So I guess this answers my question, or does it that? Land plants it was a one time thing. With with what? Land plants had one common ancestor instead of not not several. Yes, all embryophytes are more closely related to each other than to yeah, anything it's a, else. It's 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 a uh, clade. It's a monophyletic. Yeah. Yes. Like, they, they, we're, they, now, they, we're now in a, in a branching one, system. 
yep, they got up there one time. And they're like, nope, no one else is no one's coming on land but me, but me, guys. You all stay in the ocean. Well, I'm well, staying. no, no. I mean, well, no. There, there are other algae that are on land. Like there are, uh, <laughs> what are they called? Uh, the the core chlor the the core chlorophytes up there. There are, are ovophytes and tribuophytes who are on land also. Okay, but these are the land plants. Okay, the embryophytes are just called the land plants. So. But uh, now, I, I didn't regarding mean to that, cause, uh, confusion. before we get into the uh, um, uh, the, the various papers, were any of them giving like a time frame as to when they thought that level occurred? With regard to which which ones? Oh well, the, in the next the the, the next slide you have uh, the, uh, the the so the land plants. The, oh, the, the, well, the uh, leads off into that that basal node, that baseline. Okay, so that, that bottom node right there between the carophytes and land plants, that was over 500 million years ago. We're probably talking like late Precambrian when that was occurring. Mm -hmm. okay. Interesting like, period, yeah. So this would be after the snowball earth ends, yes. which opens up habitat covered with ice. Yeah, uh, the, the, uh, the red algae had already made uh, quite a few steps. Um, towards multicellularity because you have like Bangiomorpha and Raphatasmia, which date to over 1 billion years ago. So they were kind of first in terms of, in terms of Archaeplastids getting um, large. And so the, the Viridi plantae, the green algae, they kind of waited a while and then got large later. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's also interesting to note, like uh, in your figure, you see like at the bottom, you see a diplo haplotonic life cycle. It's interesting to know like, <laughs> The, We're gonna talk about that. <laughs> the, That's the yeah. next slide. Real the fast. Uh, real fa uh, also, real fast. Since Brainbug is here, we and Brainbug talked about the race between between us and the, and and his his clay, the bugs and stuff. So what's what's got the land first? His bugs or the plants? Plants. So I think the, I think the plants made it first. Yeah, plants yeah, plants and, show and, up and, in the Ordovician, whereas I think the earliest uh, arthropods show up in either late Ordovician or early Silurian. Yeah, and yeah. In part it relates. To so, are you saying uh, that they did the occur in the Cambrian the explosion? Are you saying that I, they, I, they weren't there? I heard two. I heard <laughs> you and RJ talking at the same time. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nestle. I, I was just making a joke about, like, are you saying that, pla that the land plants weren't there in the Cambrian explosion? They were probably fulfilling little their little charophyte yeah. lives on, you know, on the seafloor, but uh, they probably weren't doing a whole lot. So, so are you saying yeah, they were... It could be that, that you had a double... If, if you would make pay for the intelligent design boom, if they could say, hey, two explosions in... As you can see the dynamic spring of the things that are going to explode as plants in time. Oh. Cambrian that eventually explode in entirely new ways in next periods. Uh, so plants, uh, it can be argued that that general environmental shift that's taking place that leads to the Ediacara biota and then to the Cambrian explosion is involving just as vast a uh, transformation in the groups that are uh, leading off into plants the time frame is just doesn't surprise me at all yeah there are algae um which have a degree of of um morphological specialization which are from the ediacaran like uh was it long shanophyte and, and anhuophyte and and so yeah there there is some complexity among the algae and the but aside from that it's like how much diversity was among the algae at that time well kind of the same for animals who knows how much complexity there was everything was small and, and, and soft. for big picture you know? aspect the the general view that i've been seeing is that that sexual reproduction in general is a dynamic that organisms in part co-opting the systems uh, that involve all and cell differentiation connected up with the need to evade parasites and that sexual so, reproduction shuffles that field in a way that they can keep at least half a step ahead or pace with their potential parasites. By the way, you're so you're by the way, so you're saying that none of these came out up uh, during day four of the, of the creation week. Absolutely. No. no. So and remember, all the sun <laughs> and the stars supposedly oh, RJ, RJ, are created I, I, after plant. I think Jackson wants to continue. <laughs> okay. <Yeah>. So. <laughs> 
Okay, so that, up, yeah. that point about <laughs> um about embryos. So what what uh, what Nestle pointed out earlier with the uh, diploaplontic or haplodiplontic, I've seen it either way. It's <laughs> I don't use either of those terms actually because I think the the term uh, gametic is easier or sorry sporic is easier. Uh, I I use alternation of generation, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, you're right. Either way, um, so you have the zygote, which is now in a structure, the archegonium, rather than being out in the open water, right? We're not just releasing all of our gametes into the water and, for, and doing external fertilization anymore. Now we're doing internal fertilization. And this is important because this is one of the big steps that makes plants. And again, there are other cellular little differences between charophytes and bryophytes, or okay. charophytes and embryophytes, but uh, this is really the big one. This is why the land plants are called the embryophytes. Uh, and mo most of these are are most of these are wind plants. Not, not. Uh, no. Okay. Well, yes and no. It depends on which clade you're looking at because there are wind. There are wind pollinated gymnosperms and angiosperms and ferns uh, and lycophytes. But predominantly for your bryophytes and your lycophytes, as we'll see, this is mainly occurring due to water. Okay. It's like rain. They're living near water or partially in water and they're very low to the ground so rain is like washing the the, the sperm onto the archegonium fer thus fertilizing which is the eggs. understandable dynamic from organisms that were starting out with a water-based environment anyway that are now moving into a new niche that leaves them separate from things that's going to munch on them correct yes then that is absolutely correct and that will uh will oh lead us Unmixon has put in a typical creationist trope. Wait, wait, what? Who? Uh, Kenny finds never evolved pattern kind because nobody ever seen. And Kenny also doesn't know how to spell there. RJ, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I don't yeah, know if it's, it's just me. It's, it's, um, also, it's also me. Like you really like so, like sometimes you are. Uh, oh, like, I may be I may be bleeding yeah. out now uh, because of the rules of stream yard. Anyone was just making a snark up. Uh, Kenny's uh, creation there. RJ, have you? Uh, it might be easier if you try um, just doing uh, or turning your camera off. It might help a little bit. Yeah, yeah, We're that might help a little bit. Now. Okay, so uh, okay, okay, so yeah. but as and as you were saying, RJ, this 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 point about we're moving from a water-based environment to a land-based environment. That's an important step because now you're not bathed in a fluid, which is just moving nutrients around and moving everything around. Now you're moving yeah. to a more uh, difficult environment, a more stressful environment, and that's going to impact how plants evolve and how they fer get fertilized. And so this is bringing us uh, a little bit closer. First, we got to kind of define some terms because mm -hmm. uh, if, if we don't, I feel like it might get lost for the audience. I know you guys already know the, the difference, but for the this is more for the audience. Can you okay. explain yeah. to the audience what this means? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so haploid and diploid. So it it's haploid means you only have um, one copy of each chromosome. You only have half your parental set. So for instance, so you can think of it as half haploid. They both start with H. Whereas diploid, you have your full complement of chromosomes. You have the ones from your father and the ones from your mother in you at the same time. Okay, uh, so uh, protists, fungi, and most algae are haploid most of their lives. And why they are will become apparent in a moment, but um, but they have a low chance of survival. Most of them do. Fungi do something kind of interesting, but we'll get to that. Um, they have a low chance of survival because you're producing a huge amount of offspring. This is what's called R selection. So you produce a large amount of offspring, but you have very little parental input, and thus, as a result, your uh, the the uh, mortality of your offspring is very high. Very few of them are actually going to make it to adulthood. Or few in a relative sense, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's still going to be a lot of them compared to how many offspring we have, but it's it's in terms of percentage wise, it's going to be fewer of them, and so. Um, the, the problem with being haploid, though, is you can't be a complex multicellular organism if you're haploid, uh, in part because you, if you have a, if you get a recessive allele, which is deleterious, for instance, you're screwed. You're just screwed from the ground up. <laughs> so by having two copies of each chromosome, or three or four, however many, you 
uh, less than the likelihood that you are going to get a deleterious allele that just screws you completely. So is this like the difference between sexual and asexual? Uh, not necessarily. You can be either asexual or sexual and be both or be either one. It, you don't have to be. You can be haploid and be asexual or be haploid and be di every be asexual and be ha haploid or diploid. Sorry. Um, for instance, um, rotifers are asexual or a class of rotifers, the deloid rotifers are asexual, but they're diploid because they're animals. And so you can be asexual and be either. It doesn't really matter. But when you do sex, you have to recombine or you have to combine your, your haploid um, gametes to form a diploid zygote. You have to do that at some point. So for a point in your life, even if it's a very short point, you are diploid. That's the that's the point. And so as okay. and so that did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So so here's where things start to get complicated. <laughs> they haven't already. Um, so all this was simple belt. before. This is also shot was kindergarten level. Now we're now we're going to middle school level. Right, exactly. Um, uh, so, okay, so I'm going to attempt to explain this as easily as I possibly can. Um, if I say something, or if you guys think there's a better way to explain it, please jump in. Um, so, what we'll start with the zygotic life cycle. You see, I, it I says, think you can perhaps first start with uh, the, like the the familiar, like uh, what happened in, in us, like we are well, sure gametic. Yeah. Well, yeah. okay, sure. We can start with that one. I was thinking of starting with zygotic because it's kind of the the starting life cycle that everything begins with. But you're right; we can do gametic also. So, you see, we have zygotic, gametic, and sporic. Well, we are gametic organisms. We're gametic because we are diploid almost our entire lives. The only point at which at which we are haploid is when we produce gametes. Our gametes only have uh, you know half a complement of chromosomes we the males make sperm the females yeah. make eggs and so these combine during sex to form the zygote and from then on the whole rest of your life until you know you produce a uh, sperm and egg you are diploid yeah so that's and the, and the and the gametes do not undergo mitosis they, they, they are the only cell the only cell, cell like cell division that have uh, only uh, one copy of the genome like the all our all our rest of our cells that do undergo mitosis are diploid. So it's so Correct. significant. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, uh, the, the next kind of really big one, because sporic is what plants do. And we'll get to that in a moment, but zygotic is what most protists do. So this is what you, you could think of this as like the, the original, the starting point. Most protists mm -hmm. do the zygotic um, uh, life cycle. And the reason they do that is you have, you are, um, uh, you're haploid for most of your life. The only time at which you are diploid is when you're a zygote. That's the only time. As yeah. soon as you become a zygote, you do um, meiosis and you produce your, um, your, your spores, which are haploid. And then those uh, undergo mitosis to produce your gametes. And then your gametes combine to form a zygote and round and round the cycle yeah. goes. It's pretty much the opposite of us. Like we, like when we undergo uh, meiosis, yes, they, 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 our haploid cells immediately fuse into, into a zygote. But in these, when they go to, into a zygote, they immediately undergo meiosis. It's the exact opposite. Okay, yeah, of us. <laughs> exactly right, right. And so this is what most. This is what the the sim. You know, I'm going to say it again. This is what the simplest quote, quote, organisms do. And they do this because you're, you're going to live for a very short amount of time and you're producing a huge amount of offspring and most of them are going to get killed. Right. But the point isn't to have a long life. The point is just to reproduce. It's the selfish gene in action there. Right. You just want your offspring to survive. And so now we kind of move over to the sporic life cycle. Now, this is what plants do as well as a a couple yeah. other uh, algae. Oh, oh, perhaps, like, if I can maybe add something, maybe it's also the case that because if you have a shor shorter genome, it's much more easier to uh, reproduce. So that's why the uh, single celled are mo most often haploid because they can reproduce much faster by mitosis. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. 
And so, whereas some of the most gigantic genomes are over in plants. Right. Yeah. And also, and also, weirdly enough, amoebas. What's the deal with these guys? <laughs> um, they just got tooed. But so, so it's it's also kind of um, a little bit misleading, perhaps, to think of these as like separate things. As you're either zygotic or you're sporic or you're gametic. This is biology, right? Things don't follow rules in biology. That's the first rule of biology. And first so, rule, like, biology is like Fight Club. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. First rule of biology: we don't follow rules. So, well, things for are for a series of components: the meiosis, the 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 haploid versus diploid issues, and the various mechanisms that generate them as a series of pieces that can be shuffleboarded by organisms in lots of ways, and that these three versions have proven to be very durable. We don't know whether there might be other ways to shuffleboard those components in organisms that may have had a, 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 a time on the stage and then went extinct, but we don't know about them because they're extinct. Yeah, that, that, that's a fair point. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so now we go to the sporic cycle, and I put over here on the side, uh, it involves the elongation of the diploid stage. So rather than being almost entirely or pretty much entirely haploid or being entirely diploid, you have a, a portion of your lifestyle uh, of your life cycle which is haploid and a portion of your life cycle which is diploid and you do this by elongating the diploid stage now as by i mitosis. put here yeah by mitosis yes yeah. by mitosis yes you are actually you have your spores and they're undergoing mitosis so they're growing into a structure rather than just being little unicellular spores and so as i put here on the side you have ectocarpus and bryophytes so ectocarpus is uh, one of your uh, uh, brown algae and then you have the bryophytes, which are the um, most basally derived with respect to the other plants or the, the other embryophytes. And so that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? That the, the most basally derived land plants would have the shortest diploid stage relative to the others. It's almost like they're kind of a, mm -hmm. a, a transitional <laughs> sort of stage. But yeah. Yeah. And so, and so you're the systems for all of these things regulated by genetic switches that would deploy them turning on and off so that the difference between uh say gametic and sporic is not so much the, the biological systems but the the regulatory systems that turn those sequences on and off and then the things that can hitchhike yes. and alter how that happens yes yeah you're, you are correct it's it's really just it's, as as nestle said it's literally just a matter of when are you doing mitosis and meiosis that's really about it and so if you if you can once you can regulate when you do mitosis and meiosis, the rest is just kind of icing on the cake. How many how many times can you do it? What sort of structure can you build with it? All that kind of jazz. But that flows afterwards. And so you're right. It's 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 just regulatory switches. That's all we're doing. And so to go from this more zygotic life cycle, which is in uh, charophytes, to the sporic life cycle of plants, it's 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 just a matter of changing the timing of a development. These are these are um, they're equivalent of 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 like Hox gene um, uh, mutations, but they have different, they have things like, um, oh, what do they call Like Wuschel and these other um, genes which are involved in like heterochronic uh, processes that we don't have, obviously, because we're not plants. So does this make sense in terms of alternation of generations? Do you guys, does that, does that make sense? I, yeah, or, I think so. It's so the, mm -hmm. the principle is covered, I think, yes. Okay. So, so real fast. So, uh, are all of these ways different ways plants go, or all you or all all eukaryotes? Okay. So yeah, all eukaryotes do a a version of one of these, and so yeah. you can either do you can either you know be more zygotic or more sporic or more gametic, but you're doing one of these by and large. You can that's think just a way of looking at it. People a deep basal a railroad where you see the tracks splitting and move. Spinning along tracks, and as you become more and more specialized, just the dynamic landscape of how because animals and plants have ended up looking very different, right? Not so much because they have a completely different uh, genetic system as their deep basal, but because they've shuffleboarded those pieces in different ways and therefore facing a, a different set of circumstances that plants carry with them a power source. That is of that tertiary, uh, that uh, class endosymbiosis event that animals don't have the advantage of. They got to eat their energy sources. 
Right. Yeah. So mainly, but m- m- mostly the plants. <laughs> yeah, mostly the plants. Yeah. So okay, so I think we've covered alternation of generations decently well. Uh, unless you have any questions from the audience, which you know filled those, of course. Yeah. So well, one thing to one thing to remember from here on on is is the the imbalance between the sporophyte and the gametophyte. Like in the bryophytes, like the, the non-vascular plants, the uh, the uh, 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 no sporophyte, the uh, Gametophyte uh, stage dominates because yes, or, or, yes, I think so. Yeah, right. Oh no, 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 no. The no, spor- no, the sporophyte. Yeah, the sporophyte yeah, dominates, spor- and yes. you have your your short uh, gametophyte. So you are getting. So we are we are progressively elongating our diploid stage. Oh, no, no, no. It, it it is the gametophyte. The uh, gametophyte is the uh, haploid. The haploid stage dominates in the bri- in the bryophytes. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. You're right. I'm getting confused myself. Okay, here we uh, go. I, yes. I also get to, to confuse something. <laughs> we, yes, we will yeah. come back to this. Um, yeah, you have your your gametophyte stage, which is your 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 body, and so but you elongate. We are elongating our um our diploid stage, which is our sporophyte. That's oh, the you, important you can, also, point. you can also see in the next slide with the uh, bryophyte or the uh, the uh, moss or no the. Uh... Isn't it? Yeah, the, 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 this one, yes. You can see the, the main body with the with the leaves or the quote unquote mm-hmm. leaves. Right. They, are, they aren't proper leaves yet, but still, <laughs> these right. uh, the, the main body is gametophyte. The, 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 these, the, these are haploid, and the top is like the sporophyte. And the, this is just a simple structure that is just only for reproduction. Right. Quite yep. Good. So. Okay, yeah, we'll, and we'll get we'll get more into that in a moment. So, so first, we just want to kind of show you um, the diversity of the bryophytes, which is I put these in quotes because it's not settled whether bryophytes, the liverworts, hornworts, and mosses, constitute a monophyletic group or a paraphyletic group. Now, personally, I would like them to be paraphyletic, but if they're not, I will also accept the results. But I just uh, think you, it, real fast, can you explain the difference, difference between a monophyletic and paraphyletic so monophyletic means they are one group let me go back okay so here for instance so if we're looking at you see the spermatophytes which is the smallest grouping here spermatophytes are monophyletic it's just what it's these all the groups share one common ancestor whereas if we were to look at you know uh bryophytes are thought to be paraphyletic or something bryophytes are paraphyletic because they are three separate groups there is one group which shares each group shares a uh, more close or closer common ancestry with the other plants than with the other bryophytes i, yeah. I believe it's the mosses are i believe it's the mosses isn't it or more closely related to the others oh, you, you have three you have three groups of uh, bryophytes there are the liverworts the mosses mm-hmm. and the hornworts and uh like some some phylogenies, they show that the hornworts are more closely related to the to the, uh, okay. to the vascular plants, and next yep. is the mosses, and the next is the liverworts. Liverworts are the are the, the most basal split, right? Uh, according yes. to some uh, in broad terms, um, polyph- uh, polyphyletic is is an analog to um, convergence that you have because of things that look similar genetically or morphologically, that they're being classified together inaccurately because they don't have enough information to resolve what their actual relationship is. So that's that's effectively what's happening. Is that like, like people that... Groups, people, as opposed like, to monophyl, which is a, the, the correct uh, of logic. So is that like 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 people say that fish and reptiles are fi- are phyle... F- f- no, that's paraphyly. That's what I meant. I can't say the fucking... That's paraphyly. It'd be polyphyly would be more like if you said um like endothermy. So warm bloodedness is polyphyletic because it shows up in different groups not related, not due to common ancestry. Or, so, or like, animals that fly. Animals or that. animals that fly. Yeah. You have, you have insects, pterosaurs, birds, yeah. and bats, and none of them are descended from a common winged ancestor yeah. they have different non-winged ancestors uh, the, the simple is to say that uh, polyphy- polyphyly is the result of like convergent evolution and paraf- paraphyly is like the, like ignoring a subgroup that has a special derived trait right Basically, and, yeah. and the correct phylogeny will always be a monophyletic one right. because now you have identified the correct relationship yeah yeah they all share ultimately one common ancestor so yeah so um, the earliest land plant remains are spores, which date to the 
or division. So that is when we, we see the very first evidence of plants on land. And we're probably bryophyte uh, spores because we don't see the earliest ferns and other things until later. I also uh, see uh, the uh, like the quintessential uh, primitive plant fossil. I think uh, also called again the uh, oh, Cooksonia. 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 Actually, yes. it's funny you mentioned that because I have <laughs> a slide on that later. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> not not Cooksonia. Well, actually, not Cooksonia in particular. Um, I kind of thought about it and I changed it. Uh, but it, it is relevant to our discussion uh, in a little while, but not quite yet. We're, that's a little bit um, upstream of where we're looking at the moment. Let me, let me lo reminder for everybody, the Ordovician is the period immediately after the Cambrian. So this is the yes. step in the time. Whoops, I'm getting somebody calling me. So, um, so as we were looking at earlier, uh, and as, as Nestle pointed out, we have the sporophyte Hello? and the gametophyte. And these are, RJ, you got to mute yourself. Okay, so <laughs> we um uh we have the the uh, sporophyte and gametophyte. The sporophyte is the actual is is um producing here. This one's easier to see. You have your sporophyte, which is uh, uh undergoing meiosis to produce your haploid spores. Now the haploid spores combine, or sorry, they 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 don't combine. The spores don't combine. They undergo mitosis to produce your gametophyte, which is your actual plant structure that you see. Right. These form your male and female parts, your antheridia, which is your male part, which produces the, the sperm, and your archegonia, which produce your eggs. And so your sperm are going to go down in the archegonium, and they're going to fertilize the egg, and you're going to have a zygote, right? You're going to yeah. have which is going to form your embryo. And, and, and as the figure uh, excellently shows is that the uh, reproduction, like the, the fertilization, is highly dependent on water. So that is why you, you often see bryophytes in very wet and moist environments. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, they, so are like, they, they are like the amphibious analog to like uh, the amphibians in our uh, side of the of, of yeah. uh, life. Yeah. Basically, yeah, it's you have this character that so you have your totally aquatic guys like your charophytes, then you have unsurprisingly an amphibious group, and then you have your totally terrestrial guys, and yeah. so it, it it absolutely makes sense from an evolutionary perspective why why we have this sort of these guys who are, to, are who are largely though not totally reliant on water now. Yeah, and so only for like, only for reproduction. The right. same with the same with the amphibians they are, they can live on land. Well, heck, I mean, uh, even yeah. we are are reliant on liquid for reproduction. You know, yeah, even, you're right, right. <laughs> but <laughs> but we, uh, we store we store it in our body, so yeah. Indeed, yeah, which is which is an interesting point. Um, actually, uh, Neil Shubin talks about that in um, Oh, the Universe Within, and so it's like you know, at, at some point we're all reliant on liquids because um, liquids are are. Uh, very useful in facilitating the the uh, movement of materials and so uh so we, yeah we, we now have two things that dynamics we now have two will then allow different forms of organisms to spread images depending upon how they have water exactly we now have two yecs in in our chat who's the other one why mark baker I don't know who that is. I don't really care. Anyways, um, I want right, so, to be a, a flat earther also. So yeah, ignore them. Okay. So ignore yeah, we're going to ignore those guys. All right. Yeah. So, so this is the other thing that's important about this group. So as you guys can see in this picture, um, what we have here is we have the, the body, the thallus of the plant. And at the top, you have one single sporophyte, right? Just one. And it has its one um, uh, sporangium on it. So the bryophytes, mm -hmm regardless of whether they're monophyletic or paraphyletic, they have this one, one sporophyte on the end with one sporangium. Yeah. And also, so, also have like, a, like a very simple root system. Like it's not a proper root yet. But it's it's yeah. a rhizoid. Yeah. Yeah. The rhizoids. Yep. And so you have, and, and so you have this very simple system, uh, which I mean, you know, it, it's simple in quotes, but it also works because evolution is not about what is the best. What is, how can we make things more complex? If it works, it works, and it's going to stick around until something kills it off. That's just how evolution works. It doesn't have and to dynamically be over complex. Is basically the power system for the display mode for its sexing. 
I'm sorry, RJ. I didn't catch that. It was you were roboting. Oh, it was the power plant that drives that single sex organ uh, generation. The 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 power plant. <laughs> yeah, the 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 the, the photosynthetic system. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The the yeah the photosynthetic system. You have your chloroplasts, and these are in the gametophyte. Yeah. And so the gametophyte is is using this extra, you know, um, energy system, and so yeah. that, that's what that's what's going on in there. But this is also the important point to drive to home the point that the gametophyte is like the the, the, the main function is to like uh, grow and to, yeah, absorb sunlight, and then the sporophyte is just reproduction. Like the, it doesn't have any uh, green tissue if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And and we'll see that again as we as we you know go on to the later plants. Yeah. And so so this this point here with this slide, I probably should have switched them, but, but yeah. Oh well. Water under the bridge. So the important point here is that you have this sort of this one sporangium at the end. You have one sporophyte on here and one sporangium. Well, all the other plants post this the bryophyte grade. We'll call it are what are known as polysporangiophyta. And the reason is. You got one plant, but it's got a bunch of sporangium on it, right? So this is, uh, so you're you're gonna have a whole bunch on one instead of just one for one, and that's probably a way to increase your likelihood of getting fertilized. That's what I, I would, <laughs> I would say. And so, as as Nestle pointed out, you have your very old. Uh, these are non-vascular polysporangiophytes. So we're between the bryophyte, the extant bryophytes, and the extant uh, uh, things like uh, the uh, vascular plants, like um, the the lycopsids. So we haven't so, quite gotten to lycopsids yet. We're still so, dealing with very ancient fossil groups. But you can see here they have the polysporangia. It's one plant with multiple sporangia. So the question. Does non-vascular mean it, it, it doesn't take water nutrients out, up from the roots? No, they, they take water, but it's it, it's the system of how they distribute it, which is actually uh, what I have in this one. So we have our, our Lycopodiopsida, which is our first uh, extant vascular uh, plant group. So the vascular plants are the tracheophytes. And uh, to answer your question, um, Lamont, we have, they have two vascular tissues. You have the xylem, which conducts water and minerals. And then you have the phloem, which conducts the products of photosynthesis. So like glucose, for instance. Yeah. So all of your plants from, uh, so so not from here, from here onward, the lycopods, the ferns, the the trees, you know, trees, bushes, the flowering plants, the gymnosperms, all those guys have xylem and phloem. That's yeah. the next big step. So we had our embryo, we had the embryo, that was our first step way back. Our, our... Okay, so we had our embryo, right? That was our Ooh. first big step. And then we have a, a movement gradually towards uh, the sporic life cycle. So we're putting greater emphasis on our diploid stage rather than, uh, or, and less less time on our on our haploid stage. So these are our big kind of things. And now yeah. we have- the, re the reason why they, why they are big is because the uh, vascular system allows for a greater height because when you are transporting water to greater and greater heights, it becomes really hard to fight against gravity. So you, you actually really need a vascular system to transport the water from the, from the ground to the, to the top. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. And, and you've got another big picture issue. Remember the Devonian period, we just skipped an entire geological epoch. The Devonian is not the period after the Orgy and the Silurian is, and then the the Devonian. Oh, yeah. It's probably what, no coincidence that the Lurian is a period of ice ages. There's a climate going on. So the plants are kind of going in. The ancestors of plants are in a hiatus mode and then spring when things warm up during the Devonian. Yeah, uh, we, we do have the early. That's So that's when the evolution of the, um, the early. So you've got like. You're kind of post bryophytes and you're moving towards your polysporangia. You're moving towards your vascular plants. So you have multiple sporangia on these plants, but you're not vascular yet. So we've kind of hit our first step. <laughs> Would you say these are transitional forms? <laughs> and so, bum, bum, yeah. bum. and so we we are moving in the direction of vascular plants, but we're not quite there yet. We're still oh. fairly small. 
Oh, this is beautiful. I, I, I know, I know I said to ignore the live chat, but you, we have a young earth, younger creationist argue uh, against a flat earther who is also a younger creationist. Oh, Christ. And, and they are having a bi- Bible. <laughs> Bible says... Dueling dogmas! <laughs> You're just wrong. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, never mind. I, I was just... Uh, it's just funny to note that this is going on in the light. But anyway. Yeah. That is that is a little humorous. Yeah. Um, yeah. But to go back to, to Netflix's point, um, yes, it does get increasingly difficult to deal with gravity. And so you have to have these vascular... T- so these vascular tissues are allowing these plants to um, move materials up up the plant. These vascular tissues are allowing you to move stuff, you know, up and down the plant. Yep. And so here we have our lycopods. Um, these little guys, you have these little guys, which are, are modern lycopods and see, they're pretty small. Those are leaves next to them. They're not very big. Oh, so these, so th- th- this is like where the leaves came from? Or... Uh, not quite. We're not quite to leaves yet. These are, uh, what are they called? Microfills, I think. Um, they're like, they're, they're sort of like leaves. So you have sort of like proto leaf systems going on. And I guess you could really say the same about ferns. You have like little leafy kind of things going on, but they're not leaves in the true sense yet. Okay. Yeah. So um, you did have incredible uh, arms did. raised with this with this vascular element because as you get bigger, now you can create forests, and you can not have the forest with a cr- tree that's basically shading down what's below, and that's heating the sunlight from the things down below. So now you're in an arms race between vascular plants and non plants for habitat niche but to partition. Yeah. And you also have like, of course, you, not only do you need like a vascular system to fight against gravity, you need a very rigid structure. And this is where the, you get the invention of like lignin, mm-hmm. which is a very significant effect on the carboniferous period. Well, <laughs> yep. We will be getting to yeah. that um, yeah. shortly. We have to figure out how to, how to munch it. Yeah, 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 that and that will also play play a very big role. Um, and most later, these, I don't know. And the, the, the arthropods are, are here yet, but most of the most of these plants didn't have anything eating them yet. I'm guessing. Oh no! I mean, there were things. There were, there were herbivores. We're in the Devonian now, yeah, so yeah, there, the, are, in, in there are, are tetrapods on land play during and, the Devonian. Yeah, there are tetrapods. There are um, um, arthropods. You got you got different things. Uh, nematodes. There are things okay. on land now. I, I, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any tetrapod uh, herbivores at the time. Like I think, like the first herbivores, like were more like in the in the. Oh, you may be right on that. I don't. Maybe, maybe, maybe the maybe there were in, there were probably insects or arthropods. Maybe that they were feeding. Like I think. Yeah, that, I think, that's a good point. I think, I think, I think Arthropleura was is considered a herbivore, right? The like the giant. Oh centipede. yeah, it was a millipede. Yeah. Or, yeah, or millipede. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right about well, that. Well, that, that's so, yeah, also so at the very least. The, there are arthropods and nematodes of the animal who are munching plants. Yeah. that they need gut bacteria right. process plant material. Yeah, it, it's either yeah, it's probably the earliest tetrapods were either Carboniferous or Permian, and right. so. But at this point, yeah, you just got little guys. But nothing can degrade uh, lignin yet, which will be problematic later on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so some of some of the lycopods in the past got pretty big, like Lepidodendron. Uh, so you had a, a whole like forest of trees that were not trees. There were like fights. Yeah, yeah. they're club mosses. Which yeah, we're, we're talking like kinda... like a hundred feet tall, as so, I recall. So basically, basically, trees that were not trees. They were club mosses, which are not mosses either. Yeah, kind of like convergent evolution thing. Yes. Yeah. Names um, are names are confusing with plants always. These would have yeah. been like the first. Um, large plants would have been the lycopods. Yeah. Uh, the, the gymnosperms the, weren't coming on the, the scene the, until a little bit later. The megaflora. Yes, I have invented a new name which sounds awesome. <laughs> I do like it. I like the that megaflora. term, megaflora. Megaflora, yeah. yeah. But we know, so, we know of megafauna, but we never say megaflora, I think, right? Or is it... Is that's, a, yeah. yeah, I guess you're yeah. right. I, I haven't thought... Yeah, I haven't really thought about that, but that is... That's why, why I decided to make this video, because we don't think of these things. Nestle coin, you have to like write a technical paper now. Yes, to coin that term. I, I deserve it. <laughs> I deserve it, yes. So, uh, so now we're looking Copyrighted. at the <laughs> Anyone who uses that term owes me five bucks, yeah. Um, so now we're using, uh, we're, we're going to the lycopod life cycle. So now things are a little bit different because we're not just depositing spores, which are all the same size, or they're not growing into like their own little, uh, 
Yeah, the, Damn. They're, they're, there's yeah, a then, Wikipedia page on Mechaflora. Damn it. There is. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Nestlig. Maybe you can still buy the word. Like Candy Crush tried to buy the word. It candy, is boiled you know? again. <laughs> uh, but anyways, so now we're not dealing with spores, which are the same size anymore as we were previously with our bryophytes and with uh, taurophytes and all those guys. Now we're dealing with spores that are different sizes. Our microspores and our megaspores. And so the microspore, so you have your microspores, which are on your your um, sporophyte. And these are undergoing mitosis to form your, or to, in essence, become, I guess, the, the gametophyte, which then produces your sperm and your eggs. Okay, so spores uh, and seeds aren't the same thing then? Seed, well, we're not even dealing with seeds yet. That's later on. Oh, okay, right. Seeds haven't been around yet. Okay. Yeah, seeds aren't around yet. We're still dealing with, with spores uh, and... and, and uh, a particular type of, of sperm and egg, or well, it's really just a sperm that that um, is going to change because the earlier sperm were more like uh, more like kind of the ancestral chlamydomonas rather than uh, something like pollen. Pollen is is also a development that will come to later. Yeah, um, right. Also, right. Also, it's almost things are now change. We can also note not not a significant difference. Like remember that in the biophytes, the uh, the um, uh, gametophyte was the, the the green part, the main, mm -hmm. the main part. But here, the sporophyte is the green part. The, the, the diploid stage is now the photosynthetic. Stage. Yes, yeah, we are we are moving. Um, yes, so we have we are moving in the direction of having increased uh, reliance on our um, diploid, yeah, on our diploid stage. As we're getting, we're dealing more. It, it, we're not relying on water alone anymore right we're getting we're moving away from the the watery environment getting more onto land and so um, it opens up new habitats yes it does and so you have your your microspore and your, your microspores and your megaspores and your megaspore uh is what's going to produce is what's going to undergo mitosis and produce your eggs and your microspores microspore is going to undergo mitosis and produce your uh your sperm and so then these, of course, your sperm are going to leave and then they're going to enter the archegonium as we've already covered over and over and over. And that's going to become your, your zygote, right? And then you grow and you become a, a grown plant and you do the whole thing again, right? So again, we're still relying on the archegonium, the embryo, the, the embryo to uh, as, as part of the process so that we can produce a new plant, right? right. Is that all good? Yes. Yeah, okay. Good. Okay. So the manilophytes. Now we are to the ferns and horsetails. So these are the last uh, uh, vascular plants that we're going to talk about. You who um, utilize spores. They do it kind of differently than. I do have so, a I do have a question though. I was uh -huh. again. I know that you're at this. Can plants fertilize themselves, or do they need to have a separate plant? have their babies no yeah you can have of um have selfing you can do that uh that's what um that's what mendel was doing with the pea plants wasn't it he was doing like selfing versus crossing okay wasn't he nestling am i am i getting that wrong yeah yes i am getting that wrong <laughs> i think i think i think, I think, I think he, he had selfing, right. yeah versus crossing and he was looking at at the um the distribution of traits as you Okay. As you do yeah. those those two things, but yes, you can I, fertilize yourself, but you don't I, want to. Because I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't know if that would be like, uh, what's it called? Less diversity and more chances to have uh, parasites and stuff. You're doing to yourself. Well, yeah, you're giving yourself. You know, you're, you're giving they're, yourself. They're actually, the actually plants who like uh, of uh, it's much later, of course, it's flowering plants, but uh, mm -hmm. there are some flowering plants who. Who prevent outcrossing by keeping their mm -hmm. flowers closed and they just self fertilize <laughs> that way? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Some, yeah, some do that, and so. Uh, but I think in general, you want to have outcrossing because yeah. you want genetic diversity. Because as you know, as you guys are talking about, it, it prevents parasites and all sorts of other things. You have uh, increased chance of adapting to an environment and blah blah blah. Right. Oh, so I, in general, I, I remember I remember having read an article uh, about like the explanation of why some plants 
prefer outcrossing and why some prefer inco- like selfing. And I think mm-hmm. it was like D- Darwin had that explanation for that and he was proven right, I think. I, I have to look that up. So uh, I will be back for that. Yeah, I, I don't remember. Um, yeah, you so, got some okay. hermaphrodite plants. Uh, and so you got some bisexual uh, flowers. Uh, things are really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot of a lot of sexy stuff going on among plants. <laughs> so, um, so here we are again. Um, so let's compare this. So here we have our. So let's think about this. So we have our our sporophyte, which is now large. It's not the gametophyte, which is doing all of the heavy lifting in terms of of, of so photosynthesis anymore. The gametophyte is short lived. Our sporophyte is our big thing now. So we're largely diploid for most of our life we're diploid now this is we are we are going in this direction of more and more and more emphasis on being diploid because we're dealing with these highly variable environments we're not in the watery environment anymore uh we're getting more complex you know it's not just simple uh, bifurcating algae anymore now we're we're in a different system and we have different parts and we're being more complex and so there's increased reliance on the diploid rather than on the haploid. And so here, so we have our, our mature sporophyte, we'll just start there, who is producing spores in their sporangia, sporangia. And so they are releasing the spores, the spores land, and they undergo mitosis, and they produce the gametophyte, which is small and has little uh, rhizoids. But this then forms your archegonium, which is making your eggs, as we've already seen, and your antheridia, which is producing your sperm, right? And so you're releasing your sperm again, and you're getting your archegonium, your the egg within the archegonium fertilized. So we're still doing the same thing. Then you form your zygote and your gametophyte, and your your sorry, your sporophyte is now growing out of your gametophyte. So the gametophyte is only existing long enough for you to um, for you to get fertilized, and then you spend the rest of your life as your sporophyte until you want to make your, your spores again. So if all so of this was to place this... in a big organism, we'd be calling it Sigourney Weaver because it would scare the shit out of us. <laughs> yeah, it's really weird to think about, like, um, if you want to, like, analogize this for humans, think about, like, you're an adult. So, like, two adults have a baby, but the baby doesn't grow up and then has its own babies, and then those grow up to become adults, <laughs> if you want to think about it that way. It's a uh, it's real weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing we we humans. I'm very glad humans don't go through that. <laughs> I'll just say. So, so these are the last guys are going to deal with who actually like um, are releasing their spores. It's it's the the manila fights, the ferns and the horsetails. From now on, we are going to be dealing with the seed plants, and the seed plants do things a little bit differently. So first. As as Nestle, as you mentioned earlier, we're going to talk about the evolution of wood. A major component of wood is is lignin, and so this lignin is allowing seed plants to get huge. And they not only are they getting tall, they're they're reaching deeper into the soil than had e- had ever been done before. And this is having drastic consequences for for everything else, including them eventually. Yeah. <laughs> and so what they do. By, plants by, rule the earth. So are these the plants, plants that again still the coal, rule the earth? The, the coal, the coal, the coal that, that we use now. No, that's even later. Okay, and then that's in the carboniferous. Not even there yet. Okay. Yeah, we. Yeah, so plants are spreading right down the line. Yeah. yeah, plants are spreading at this point, and they're first. They're getting into colonizing like the really big niche. They're spreading all over the place. And as a result, their and their their um, roots are reaching deeper into the soil than any plants had previously, because you as we talked about, plants uh, before this point have like rhizoids, so they're kind of on the top. They're not like the real roots, which are digging down deep. And the reason is, well, if you're not getting very big, why do you need really you know, sturdy roots? What, what would be the point? And so, so now. Now we have plants who are digging down and they are causing minerals to be uh, leached from the soil. So when it rains and it's washing, the rain is washing the soil away, this is ending up in bodies of water or it's ending up in rivers. Okay. And then so this, this is being trans. So at this point we do have soil now, not, not just rocks. Well, we have, 
We had soil, yeah. But we had soil, more, yeah. Yeah, okay. but it, it, it is more accelerating the, the the bedrock beneath it. I think. Yes. That's, yeah. Yeah. It, so now you're um. So yeah, now you, they run you're... amok because there's functionally nothing to stop them because there aren't bugs eat these very uh, fibrous plants. They're, they're they're in an environment where they got relatively few predators and the plants just go hog wild and they have a desert. Yeah. And so, um, so as a result of this, this, uh, leaching of minerals from the, the soil and the bedrock into the, um, the water column, this is causing phytoplankton. This is causing blooms of, of plankton, which is called eutrophication because what this does is it suffocates the other organisms in that area, it sucks all the oxygen out and they might cause, um, there are some diatoms who have, who make like, um, they're, they're poisonous. Uh, and things like that. And so you're killing off a lot of other things. But this has another consequence, which is not just killing things off in the water. Because weathering soil pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That's what uh, that was what was happening with um, when India was crashing into the, the uh, Eurasian plate and the, uh, the Himalayas were forming. You were also weathering them, and that's sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so this causes cooling. So you not only have <laughs> the suffocation of organisms in the in the ocean or in the, the nearby surrounding waters, you also have cooling. And so this is also going to have a major impact on other organisms who are used to warmer environments. So you've got it's kind of a double whammy for things in the ocean, especially. And this is also like uh, in fact, uh, affecting our evolution or like uh, when you have like a very poor oxygen condition in the water, it's a... Uh, it favors like uh, air breathing in fish also, even though they are still swimming in the water, they can mm -hmm. still, it, promo it promotes an alternative yeah, way to, to no go up air. Tetrapods yeah. are in the land in this period because there's a new environment yes. where they can find their oxygen in a different context. Because remember, uh, plants are pushing out oxygen. Generate. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Let's, I mean, they're like, hmm. Be up here with these nice plants of shade and oxygen, or down in the water where that jaw, where, where the where can be jawed fish are, are trying to eat us. Hmm. <laughs> Pretty much. And so these guys were were some of the early uh, what what are they call the pro gymnosperms, even though they're not all necessarily the ancestors of gymnosperms. They're kind of the ancestors of spermatophytes as a whole. Say things like Archaeopteris and other guys like that. And so that's happening there. And so we Ar have Archaeopteris, not to be confused with Archaeopteryx. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who named this guy, but you know, we need to find him and make him stop. He's probably dead long he dead by Greek now. But... And Latin. <laughs> He's probably like two hundred years dead by now. But regardless, he, he should have named it something different. Um, or or well, he was. I wonder who was first. Was Archaeopteris or Archaeopteryx first? That's the real question. I don't know. But uh, um, but uh, in the meantime. So now we have the gymnosperms. <clears throat> so the gymnosperms are appearing on the scene before the angiosperms, the flowering uh, plants. Although the ancestors of flowering plants were, of course, around at the same time. And there has been some work on which fossil groups are more closely related to the angiosperms than to the gymnosperms. But that's, again, that's kind of later. So gymnosperms are the cone-bearing plants. Right, these are the guy, the pine trees, your ginkgos, your cycads, um, the all of these guys. So, as you can see in this picture, so we have our mature sporophyte, and it produces male and female cones. Mm -hmm. And these are our, our microspores, or the micros, yeah, the microspores being produced by the male cone, and the megaspores being produced by the female cone. So, the microspores do mitosis, and they become the gametophyte. And then this is producing your sperm. Meanwhile, the cones, the female cones, are producing your megaspores, which undergo mitosis to produce the the eggs. They, that's where the archegonium is, as we, you know, just again and again and again. But I think it's important to harp on this because we don't think about, we tend not to think about um, plant reproductive behavior. We think about our own, and so it's kind of weird to conceptualize how plants do it. And it's also kind of difficult finding. Uh, charts that show this in good enough um, detail and also where this is happening on, on the plant. Cause a lot of them will show like it's occurring in this tissue. Okay. Yes. But where is that tissue? Right. And I, I don't really want to show that cause it won't make any sense. Plant horn. <clears throat> Basically. Yeah. So 
So then you have your fertilization <laughs> in the archegonium, right? And then that forms your. So that's that's what you have your little seeds, like yeah, your little helicopter-like seeds, because they're under the um or on top of they're on top of the of the, the little scales on the cones, and then when you get a gust of wind, whoosh, off they go. Oh, and then they is, land. Is it is a spore, the spore is not the, not the seed, right? It's, the spore is the pollen, right? The oh. the pollen are the gametes. Oh, I, oh, I saw. I, I'm uh, mistaken. Yeah, yes, you're right. Yeah. So you have your your um your uh, microspore, which then undergoes mitosis to become pollen, or to become your your gametophyte, which is producing pollen in it, and then the pollen is released. So, but at this point, both the pollen and the seed are are, went, are, are still carried by the wind, not a, any kind of animals. Well, actually, there are uh, animals that carry. So this is what the picture on the left is showing. So there's this kind of mis misconception that, oh, well, angiosperms are so much better than gymnosperms because angiosperms make, you know, are pollinated by animals and they make uh, fruits. Well, eh, wrong. Um, gymnosperms are pollinated by, or some gymnosperms are pollinated by animals, pollinated, okay. and uh, and also um, the the seeds can be contained within fruits. That is a ginkgo um, right. Uh, okay. seed right down there. I did not know that. Things even yes, more complicated. Are... Those wind patterns are generated by, in many cases, altering the way things generating wind patterns and all that plate movements around. So there's a picture regulator as to the winds that ultimately play a role in how successful wind-borne um, seed dispersal is. Yeah, that would actually be a very interesting, um, very interesting uh, sort of thought experiment. Like, if if the wind pattern were different, how would that affect you know the evolution in different areas? Right. I think that'd be kind or of at least their biography. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're, 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 yeah, their geography and all that jazz. So, but um. So yeah, is it complicated so, enough for you yet, kids? Because they're actually uh, the, the probably the most um, the most successful group of angiosperms are wind pollinated. That's the grasses. Why? Right. They're, they're not animal, you know, pollinated. They're pollinated by the wind. They're super successful. Obviously, you know, look outside. <laughs> and so, um, and this is yeah. probably probably partially due to the way that they do photosynthesis, which is a special. Uh, how is it called again? The C four or no? No, or I don't know. Uh, uh well, they could be C three or C four. I think. Yeah, yeah. Can't they? Yeah. But I think I think modern grasses are mostly C four, aren't they? Yeah. Or most modern grasses are, aren't they? And they, and, they, and they grow Either extremely way, fast. Um, they're extremely very successful. Fast. Yeah. Yes. Yes, they grow extremely fast, and so they're extremely successful. And so, yep, so it's not always about um, being pollinated. Um, there are gymnosperms, which are pollinated by weevils, which are a group of beetles. Um, you have your, your uh, fleshy plants. So the funny thing about the ginkgo is you really don't want to eat the seed because the seed is toxic, mm -hmm. uh, but the fruit tastes fine because the plant is like, I will kill you if you screw with my seed, but I really want you to move my seed to another area. Right. And so <laughs> the seed is highly, highly toxic. But the plant, but, you right, know, right. but the, the fruit is also, also, right? also, also, also true for like uh, some angio, or most angiosperms, like for example, the uh, the apricot. Like uh, the seed, it contains amygdalin. Right, yeah. Yep. It contains, Kent Hovind, it contains amygdalin. Right. Don't, don't. <laughs> not so, vitamin B seventeen. No. <laughs> so as long as you poop this out before it gets to the seed, you're yeah. fine then. Basically, yeah. Well, as long as you don't chew it up, yeah. As right. one, once you kind of pass it to your digestive tract, it'll be fine. But yeah, just just don't don't, don't break it with your teeth. Just just like you know, kind of nibble off the the fruit and swallow the seed. What did you say, RJ? I said can't uh, uh, chews and poops a lot on this. <laughs> yes, and we also like we also need to note a, a final trend or the, or the, or the uh, almost com like vir virtual completion of a trend. Like we have seen that the previous uh, steps uh, still relied on like uh, really like water, but now mm -hmm. both the, both the seeds mm -hmm. and the the way of like spreading the uh, the pollen around, mm -hmm. either by either by wind or by insects, is still is no longer water dependent as much. Right, absolutely. Now we are now we have, we've come to the point where you can rely either on wind or on animals because now you have a lot of animals uh, in your environment. You have arthropods, obviously, and uh, later for the angiosperms, they made use of of uh, you know arthropods, birds, 
uh, and even a couple of bats. So, mm -hmm. you know, which brings us now da -da -da -da, to the angiosperms. Yeah. And so the, the it's first time to get flamboyant. <laughs> so the the first or the earliest fossil record of angiosperms dates to the early Cretaceous. However, um, the genetics indicates that like the, the split between the angiosperms and gymnosperms occurred in what, like the Carboniferous or something. So, you know, clearly there's a, 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 a ghost lineage going on there. There have been um, discoveries of things that are sort of flower ish. Um, and I can't remember the name of the group off the top of my head, but it's um, there. There are like a few groups in the Mesozoic, which are flower ish, but are not quite flowers, but they're also fairly removed enough that it's not like immediately obvious what corresponds to what in terms of the, the flower morphology. So there are still ghost lineages there. It's not entirely uh, worked out. So future work, future ah, paleontological and work. And let me dump in yet another neat little variable. Is the world of dinosaurs. And what we, we had are giant sauropods that were basically clifford rakes that would rake off the, the, the leaves off of the plants, mm -hmm. uh, which were often very tall, and they would get their necks long enough to be able to compete with them, and so you had a, a, a dynamic that was going on. Whereas angiosperms are in the world quickly, but have extremely tough, fibrous plant material that no sauropod can deal with. And so you eventually develop uh, batteries of teeth in hadrosaurs and also the chewing batteries that are in uh, uh, the ceratopsids that can work their way through the amangiosperms. So there's this arms race going on between pollinators and prey and predator, between plants and animals and what's eating what when and continents moving and aridity factors and you know has it gotten complicated enough so, yet so of course yeah. so, so so these are the plant these are the groups that the, the farmers take control of yeah pretty yes well the, yeah. like mo mo most crops are like in like specific subgroups of the angiosperms but yeah for the most part yeah yeah like um your fabulously successful your entire your like squash over Right, yeah, the angiosperms took over, and so, like, uh, for instance, your squash are all all squash and and pumpkins are cucurbita pipo. Yeah, for instance, um, all like most vegetables like a cauliflower and broccoli and cabbages and uh, Brussels sprouts are all um, Brassica oleracea, and mm -hmm. like lots more of them, lots lots more. And so, yeah, most of your uh, cultivars, I believe, is the word for it, are like a couple of species, most of them, and so. Uh, but yeah, it's very interesting uh, the way that, that happens and yeah. the, the yeah, like different I, I, another I, variable that oxygen had to drop to the point where forest fires didn't take place. So there's an awful lot of grasses and others that proliferate until the fire hazard issue uh, becomes dynamic. And then also when we're talking about these incredibly beautiful flowers, we have to remember too how they look to their potential pollinators. Yeah. So birds and insects see in the ultraviolet. So an awful lot of these uh, things have an even bigger signature that we can't see. We don't see ultraviolet. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, also, I, I, like, I, we are, like creation is also known, of course, that the Darwin called the origins of the uh, M angiosperms a abominable mystery. But, yeah, back in but, the yeah, mid-1800s. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. That, but that, there is a recent uh, paper I wrote two months ago that says, uh, the title says, Fossil data support a pre-Cretaceous origin of flowering plants. And yeah, well, yeah. yeah I, I, the, I, I, can, I, can, I can read from the uh, abstract, but uh, you can also look it up. Like our, yeah. resu our results I've been indicate, collecting all of the... Uh, our, our results indicate... It's actually a section in the new book. Yeah, I, I, it says our results indicate that several families originated in the Jurassic, strongly rejecting a Cretaceous origin of the group. So we mm -hmm. were, we were, we report a marked increase in lineage accumulation from uh, 125 to 72 million years ago, supporting mm -hmm. Darwin's hypothesis of a rapid Cretaceous angiosperm diversification. But, all right, it's a very right. clear abstract. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Um, the the genetic data is you know, going to precede the fossil data, and so, yeah, because once you get to the Cretaceous, it's like they all just kind of appear, and so it makes. Well, well, there's also that very interesting thing that we pointed out with the um, was it the uh, Cretaceous terrestrial revolution? You also have sort of right. 
which is kind of a carryover from the the late Jurassic, because you have a, a, a diversification of a bunch of different groups of terrestrial animals, which is probably uh, related to the uh, diversity of angiosperms, which is occurring. Right. So, so yeah, that's um, all very interesting data to consider which creation is like so. I, I would I would uh, stress it that the uh, like the uh, angiosperm diversity is like a re really what makes what what has made the world look like our or at least, at least the biological part look like the world we still have today because <laughs> like before before there were plants <coughs> like you, you like walking around in the woods would, would be really weird like no flower anywhere no, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and no grasses. Uh, no grasses I, too, yeah. I do have, a, I do have a question uh, about antiosperms. So antiosperms now, with, with mostly nowadays are are majority plant things. Was a lot of them killed off in the the KPG or KT, whatever it's called now, extinction? All the all, all other plants. Of the plants, um, the I mean, yeah, some plants were, but they they you know rebounded. And there's there's actually studies yeah. about um in specific localities how the plants rebounded across the uh the KPG boundary. Yeah, it's also it, like angiosperms and generally speaking, yeah, plants they, they, and they insects they are more yeah. resilient. Okay, and than the mean. big vertebrates. They're the ones that get really hit uh, because in, we uh, say mass extinction. It's a, we always talk about the the animals that got killed, but I don't know if any plants. Got killed off two species. Those yeah, big and then, five. Then, then, then there were probably sort of, uh, quite a few species that, that didn't make it, but for the, for the most part, like most lineages of angiosperms, like made it through. Like it's it's not like a white uh, only Correct. a few only a few angiosperms. Like there, there were lots of different groups of angiosperms that made it through, and I think it is most likely because they have seeds that can survive really long. For, uh, and wait until yeah. uh, they can hunker down yeah. in a way that animals can. Yeah. Like we, like we have seeds that, that have been locked in ice for thousands of years, and they can still sprout back to life. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're 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 a pretty resilient um, bunch, and um, so the um, the so we're almost we're almost to the end of this. Um, but so as you can see, the the um, the flower here is kind of similar to the cone. Um, because you have your, you have production of micro spores, which are your male spores and your, uh, and, and your, your mega spores, which are being, which are in the ovary. And this says the ovary, which is the archegonium, right? The archegonium produces the, the mega spores and ultimately the eggs. And so you have your microspores, which undergo mitosis to produce your male gametes, which are again, your pollen Then the wind or animal or whatever carries your pollen. And it gets it gets dropped on the um, on the 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 the, the style or and then that goes down your your pollen tube to fertilize one of your eggs, and then that forms your your zygote, as in the you know as in, in the archegonium as we saw with everything else, and that forms your seed, and then we have something interesting. The fruit. So how exactly, and so like with our, our, our ginkgo, you have your fruit. And so, <laughs> so here, so I actually, I really like this picture because it directly compares the apple to the flower. So you can see the sepals, which are the little, the little uh, leaves under the, uh, under the petals. And so they're at the very bottom of the apple. You have the ovary or, or the archegonium and their other tissues. And that forms the big middle part. And then the, the pedestal, the stem, so, which is your so top part. So fruit is kind of like the embryonic fluid or the or the or the yolk. I mean, it's sort of. It, eh, I mean, it's kind of hard to um, to sort of compare analogously compare it like that okay. because it's the, we it's don't the have bubble a, wrap and plastic uh, shrink wrap of uh, sex organs. Uh, well, also, like you you said that the, the ginkgo has a fruit, but I don't think it's technically a fruit because like a fruit is like the. <laughs> The, the, the derivative, the derivative of the uh, of the uh, how is it called again? Or the flower? Uh, no, the um, the ovule. The archegonium. No. Oh, the archegonium. I see, well, the, that's what it is. Well, the ovules are well, the ovules are what are no. getting um, uh, fertilized. They're in the ovary. The, I mean, I mean, I mean the car, I mean the carpels, like the uh, or the uh, oh, the, or oh, the, or the, the ovary, the ovary basically, by the. Uh, like the the, the 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 part like a fruit is the, it is derived from 
the part that, that, that contains the uh, ovules. The uh, so yes, but that's just so, the archaeonium. Yeah. Now, I mean, like, like you see, the, you see the pistol. Yes. You have like, and you have like the, the, the bottom part that that contains the uh, like the, the the ovaries and the ovules, like uh, that. Like if like that that is where the fruit comes from, <coughs> technically. Yes, and so, and sometimes and sometimes we have like for example strawberries, we call mm -hmm. it a fruit or, or berry. Berries are fruits also, but mm -hmm. still, <laughs> but the strawberries are not fruits and uh, no no berries because they 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 uh, they derive from the receptacle. And you can also see in the figure on the left, the receptacle is the part that is that's below the uh, mm -hmm. ovary. Basically, so right. it, it, it's so the strawberries are technically not fruits, or no berries. Right. Just like peanuts sure. aren't nuts. Yeah. Right. Right. They're legumes. Yeah. <laughs> Everything has to be so complicated. <laughs> so. So. Um, anyway. So yeah, uh, you have your your fruit, which is derived from the the parts of the flower, and we have essentially the same uh, sort of process, which is. Well, we have in, in the, the total process is overall fairly similar to what we've seen previously. We're just dealing with different parts now. We're dealing with a flower rather than, than a cone. But in terms of, you know, the, the alternation of generations, it's really not, not super different. So, but anyway, so that's in a, a very large nutshell, the evolution of plants. Half a billion years of life there. Yeah. Also, okay, yep. okay. Uh, about the thing as it as it about the uh, strawberry not being a fruit mm -hmm. because it, it comes from the receptacle. You can also see in the in the apple, not everything about the apple is basically is a fruit because you can see in the middle you can see the outline of mm -hmm. where the uh, ovule was, and the outside part of it is is also not derived from the uh, it is derived from it's not derived from the ovary. It's it's derived from the accessory tissue. Right. So it's like it's right. like a it's like a fruit in the middle of not fruit. That's, that, that's the <laughs> apple, basically. <laughs> so was, yeah. the, was the fruit ovary stuff created to protect the seeds or to spread the seeds? To I spread think so. Yeah. I mean, because yeah, you, yeah, because you, the, the fruit, yeah, the fruit is to, is to, you want to entice animals to eat it so they will defecate your seeds elsewhere, uh, you know, okay. move them to a new area. This is the how, point of how, the fruit, how is the yeah. made? The, 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 I kept saying made, but you know, the fruit, you know, to, so that they didn't eat the seeds directly and, and they like put that before they got to the seed itself. No, you don't really digest the, the seeds. You just, that's why you deposit them elsewhere in fertilizer of yeah, all things. Yeah, they have to so. be hardy enough not to be dissolved by digestive fluid. Yeah. Otherwise, if you did that with, uh, yeah, if you could dissolve them and you try, you ate like a ginkgo seed, for instance, well, <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> Is it, isn't that like what squirrels do? Don't they eat the seeds of the plants? They're eating the the like the nut. Okay. The, well, they're they're yeah they're they're like burying it and this and thus they're burying a seed. Okay. And then it's like if they don't come back to it, it oh it sprouts into a tree. Okay. Okay. I, the, the 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 one they forget about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the ones they yeah they forget about. Yeah, so the tree is selection pressure for greedy but for chipmunks. <laughs> I, I also need to mention the uh, like like I rem, uh, remember when I said about the uh, some some flowers prefer to self fertilize and some flowers prefer to uh, outcross. And there was uh, like a, like Darwin's hypothesis was that like. Like you have flowers that have uh, a certain symmetry. Like some, most flowers are like rotational symmetry. They have like, uh, if you rotate them, rotate them around, they look the same. But some flowers are bilaterally symmetrical. And these flowers are like, they have a very specific single, of the single species pollinators. And what Darwin says is that, oh, flowers, like, like uh, self-fertilization flowers, that, which, which, uh, which remain closed to self-fertilize. They do this because it is very, it's very difficult to get these, uh, sometimes to get these specific pollinators to, to be at, to uh, come along and do the pollination for them. So it's uh, really interesting to see in this paper that says, uh, let's see here, where is it? Uh, it says, Darwin suggested that the, the cleistogamous flowers, which are 
flowers that, that remain closed, help to ensure pollination, which, which he postulated, is less certain in zygomorphic taxa. Zygomorphic is the bilateral, the symmetrical taxa that rely on more specialized group pollinators. Uh, Brain Black wants to ask if we're going to talk symbiosis in plants, I guess. Well, that would be a whole video unto itself. One yeah. which, yeah, uh, <laughs> Nestle, we have, and, and RJ, we've already, uh, yes. we did a video where we discussed different um, symbioses, or, or, well, symbioses between different um, and flowers. No and, oh, are you talking about, you're talking about symbioses between like plants and arthropods or endosymbioses? I don't know. Uh, Vandalia. Uh, Rainbow. I'm not, uh, I'm not sorry. You have to ask brain yeah, back. because endosymbiosis is a much more restrictive concept than right. symbiosis yeah. in general, where do but did, did, in did, concert, we video, did we do a video? Did we do a video on like or, mutualism, or parasitism? I don't think so, right? Or not? We do. Uh, uh, not yeah, on big topic. We, yeah, we talked about sort of of um, we talked sort of broadly about the uh like symbiotic relationship between like hummingbirds and flowers mm -hmm. or between arthropods. Like we so, talked about the, uh, the fig wasps, which are right. like super specific to, to, <laughs> to particular right. species of figs. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous how, yeah. how um, narrow another, they are. Yeah. Not another reason why figs are not fruit because o only the, uh, like the very tiny uh, specks inside them are fruit and the whole thing is like, which is a, a very highly modified receptacle. Also. He said he has, he had, he had lice, Listen. Oh, we did do a video where we talked about lichens. Uh, passing yeah. chloroplast okay. was that video because we, no. yeah, we talked yeah, about um, somewhat. That was kind of, of a debate as to which one's getting the best out of that deal: the uh, bacterium or the fungi. Well, uh, it, the interesting thing is, um, <clears throat> you actually have multiple fungi or multiple um, algae or multiple bacteria, kind of all together. And we we talked about that in. Um, so, if you want to see a video where we discuss that, uh, look up uh, passing chloroplasts. Because we talk, we start with endosymbiosis, yeah. and then we go from endosymbiosis to um, sort of symbiotic relationships between different organisms like lichens, as well as with our the relationship we have with our own gut bacteria. So, okay. check that out. And before we end, and, and may I compliment? Now that I could actually see images, you did a splendid, splendid, delightful job in picking the material to be able to guide us through what is an immensely complicated subject and make it a hell of a lot clearer. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Before we end this up, I, I, another question is, when do we go from laying plants to their own thing to, to our fossil selection of plants and start breeding them for our own uses? Oh, like 10,000 well, years roots ago. Yeah. Years ago since <clears throat> yeah, well, it's, only, it's only been like a few thousand years that yeah. we started uh, doing that and even more recent, but not with all plants because there's only certain plants and then in more recent times, in, in like the past few thousand years, we have um, looked at other plants and we've started selecting them. And and uh, yeah, they're not all at the same time, at kind of different times over the past yeah. few thousand years. I think, I think we, st we started to do agriculture like around 10,000 years ago when the climate mm -hmm. weren't yeah, stable. It, it's a, a right. long part there. So we, we art, we did fire before we did, um, we did art before we domesticated plants. Yeah, like do we just say the ones that taste the best, or like just pick the ones that look pretty yeah. that, that you use? Or and this is also, this is also oh. the old joke that I've heard, hey, I just dropped out of a chicken. I wonder if it tastes good. And this is also a thing that I discussed with Depp or Dino. So like uh, like uh, we were talking about like uh, the uh, the how language developed, and it's basically the development of agriculture gave rise to civilization also, and of course. And when we produced a lot of like stuff with agriculture, we needed a system to uh, to keep uh, t tabs on what how much we produce and, and uh, where everything goes. So that necessitates the development and, and of mathematics of, 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 and astronomy yeah. to work written, out written when language. flood seasons yeah. are going to occur. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it had a huge synergy yeah. effect for the development yeah. of things. Yes, it's really, it's really like 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 that one plant. Uh, Brachia, bra I can't pronounce these things. The one that be the plant that became don't worry, cauliflower and lettuce and Brussels sprouts. Yeah. It's like, huh? What happens if we decide to make this leaf better? Let's make let's make this big. Let, no, let's make this bud bigger on this plant. Let's make this this bigger on this plant. Or brassica, brassica. Yeah, like yeah, like how we can turn these 
and this is a and this is a very interesting story about brassica like uh, you you have like one species but you have also like other species mm. who for who form a triangle of you it's called and if you look it up it's really interesting it's basically some species are like uh the hybrid of other mm-hmm. two species and the, the, another one species is a hybrid of the other two they are like oh yeah yeah it's really like, like a brassica rapa i believe yeah. is a combination of all three isn't it right or, or is a combination of the other two, I think, is, is the... I, I can show it to... Uh, maybe I can show it to... So I don't know how, yeah. how speciation works in plants, but can you yeah. still crossbreed brassica, different brassica plants to, with each other? Or are they far apart? Oh, it's kind of the same as, like, in animals. If they're too distantly related, you're not going to have the the um, hybridization. But if they, are, um, if they are close enough, you can. But there's also weird things like grafting... Uh, uh, between plants, which is another weird issue that plants have that we don't really have. Yeah, I'm sure uh, Nestle would know more about that than I do. So, I saw a lot like uh, grafting. I said uh, like, grafting is a weird thing oh, where yeah, yeah. it's like you don't have to have the the same species or whatever, but they can have. Uh, it's, uh, plant, plant immunity works very different to our like we have like the major issue incompatibility complex that really right prevents, but m- Plants don't don't have it, so it, it's probably because yeah. in the way how, how our immune systems work. Yeah, yeah I heard it, that. It, it's weird. Let me get like, pl- like plant <laughs> plant immunity is plant immunity focuses on like foreign substances that, that are not found in plants themselves. So when they when another plant basically invades, it doesn't care because like it it, it doesn't really recognize foreign substances at all. So yeah. yeah. That's why I heard, like, 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 especially of apples and stuff. Most of them are grafted or clones, and not, and not just, and not crossbreeding of each other. Oh, so can you screen share or show what I'm screen sharing? Uh, so you have yeah. to click on screen share at the bottom. Oh, really? I, I, yeah. There you go. There you go. Right. Like uh, this, this is what I uh, what I was referring to the triangle of you. Like you have many different brassica species. Maybe I can show it. Bring it up. And you have like a like uh, yeah, have, brassica rapa. Yeah, there yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, you have six different species. Like one of them is like you have a, like a nine chromosomes, and have t- one of ten and one of eight. But you have all species that have t- called allo polyploid. They have the whole genome of one pl- one species, and also the whole genome of the other species too. So it's like it's it's not just hybridization. They have like the full genome of two species. Mm-hmm. And, they, and you have it. You have it three times in this configuration. It's really interesting. Oh, nice! But before we and, and, the, yeah, and the and the one on the on the uh, bottom left, that is the uh, what we are mo- most familiar with the uh, the the, the, the uh, cabbage, the uh, broccoli, and the cauliflower on the bottom le- on the bottom left. But before we wrap this up, before we go, I gotta bring up our favorite creationist and the banana plant. Yeah. Ah yes. yeah, yeah. It's uh, it was actually Great funny number. because uh, well, Kent Hovind did something similar to that not too long ago, where he claimed the broccoli, the broccoli. was was uh, uh he's like, broccoli oh, they expect you to believe the broccoli just evolved. Um, well, he didn't know. want Ray Comfort to have exclusive dibs on the where, where, stupid. Where did broccoli cup. come so he from? He decided to outdo it. Yeah, where did broccoli come where from? Try asking the Mesopotamians. <laughs> is my is my Kent Hovind impression good? I don't know. I, yeah, uh, I think it's perfect. <laughs> absolutely. Well, Josh uh, uh, Bowen, the uh, uh, digital happy guy, does the most dead on Kent Hovind. It's yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely hilarious. Watch. But let me just give a shout out to Darwin here that up until Darwinian evolution, mathematics was kind of a mess. And it really was just, and it's no coincidence that so many botanists got yeah. on the evolution bandwagon because when they started viewing plants as deriving lineages, it all started to make sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard a uh, few years ago. I don't know if you're not. I heard that the bananas that weed are going extinct because of, of a fungus or a bacteria or yeah. something, a parasite. I mean, but the venom disease. Yes, it ha- yeah, yeah, it's, and that it's, happens. Yeah. It happens with uh, like wheat. Also, there's a um, uh, or wheat and other grains. So there's like a a, a fungus that oh. it uses uh, nearby plants as its intermediate host. So it like jumps. So it infects the like mm. the grains then goes to the other plant and then comes okay. back. And so it's like, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. But, 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 but it's like, but, but don't, yeah, it, which is the reason better... why you should to monoculture. Yeah. Like, don't we have a better chance that don't we still like 
we're not like cloning wheat, are we? We're still, but bananas, we are, we are cloning, aren't yeah, we? But, yeah, but it's, it's interesting. Like bananas are like they are like triploid. They have uh, th three copies of their genome. Like pl plants are usually okay with polyploidy, unlike animals. Like the animal animal polyploidy is really really, really rare. That's mm -hmm. why they are like they're, they're, like most of this is known like paleo polyploidy in uh, animals. But in plants, if you have like a, everything is fine in plants, unless you have like an odd number of genome copies. When you have like in bananas, you have triploid. And when you have that, like uh, it messes up the meiosis process. So you, you can't have seeds anymore. And that's mm -hmm. why you that's why you only see tiny specks in the banana. These are the, these are the vestigial seeds, okay. nothing left almost. Yeah. So yeah. is there still natural well, I ate a banana out this there? morning and not one that I Think yeah, great they're still out there. Okay, they're still Ooh. out there. They just look like like almost spherical or whatever. They're weird. Mm. They're full of seeds and they are not not hugely edible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just making sure we can hopefully we can get a new species of bananas out there. We can start eating if the bananas that we eat now are are killed off forever. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are, there are, good luck. And there are attempts at uh, uh, breeding again, so that they are like uh, planning to like uh, like making them again. Even even polyploids, like maybe four or just two genome copies, and then they breed it, and then they put it back to triplet again, just to make it seedless. So it's really uh, it's really a roundabout way of breeding again. But yeah, yeah. It, this is this is my field because I I am doing the uh, my masters in plant breeding. Oh, nice. Yes. Uh, if, I, if I if I knew that, I would, I would invite you on too to begin <laughs> with. Well, I, 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 my, my education most focuses mostly focuses on like the, uh, like how, how to apply breeding or plants in the present. I, I didn't study really the paleontological history of uh, plants, but okay. I did, I did at a, at a one one lecture of one course on like the evolution of plants. Okay, uh, and I guess the next it'd be like different different artificial plants that we that. That take forever to grow, like apples and stuff like that, and right. the quick, the quick plants like wheat and corn. Right. Mm -hmm. Like so, we yeah, like, to... like a, 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 apple, apple breeding is just uh, you, you only, you like you only do one, like uh, you, you hybridize one variety with one variety, and you hope it will produce a new variety that that way. Like you don't really do long, long generational. Like only one, one cross, and and you hope that will do it. In the long run, because will, it, it really you, takes a long time for them to will, grow. You won't will, will know for a few generations if, if that tree produced good good fruit or not. Yeah, yeah, really. You, you have to be with a long time in order to uh, have a, a, a tree that has a uh, yeah apples it, on it. Is that why we we uh, start doing quicker plants like wheat and corn and, uh, and oats and stuff like that? So we because we want and grapes because we wanted the it right away. I don't. I don't know. Like, uh, well, I, even, I, I, think, I think there will, be, there will uh, still be a demand. A long time to get going. I think there will still be a demand on apples. Like people like apples, <laughs> so uh, they they really are invested into uh, keeping the apple uh, breeding going. Yeah. So, guys, you guys have anything coming up on your channels you want to advertise? Um, yeah, more go videos. Watch, go watch Jackson. I I I don't do much on my channel, so. Go watch it. We'll, we'll be doing right. more videos. I still got um, my weekly evolution now. Stuff. Yeah, I'm working on a lot of uh, school stuff right now, and and so, um, but we'll have a new script uh, soon. Our most recent video was on uh, experimental evolution. Um, so if you like um, seeing evolution in the lab, go check that one out. What? And look, cool. rocks volume two. Oh yeah, you got yes. Oh, that, yes. Re that reminds me. I opened up a can of worms on Twitter yesterday, talking about the children's version of your book. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I, I was actually thinking about this morning about how it could be conveyed. Um, okay, children I... books are very, very. It would probably be no more than you know, forty pages or so. So you have to condense everything down. I was figuring maybe they could have. Um, a couple uh, um, uh, kids, uh, uh, characters who would be investigating things and bumping into uh, the, the Mr. Tortukin that keeps on the little tur tur saying the wrong. Stuff I would say we just give them a slogan. One. I say we just give them a slogan. Don't do creationism, <laughs> kids. <laughs> yeah. The new creationism kids on the block. Yeah. The brothers, you don't want your children to grow up to be Cantovian. 
<laughs> rock mess that. <laughs> uh, uh, I got to answer like one the brain bug in the live that you asked about the, uh, the like the yeah from cold like uh, you you had one banana. I think it was the uh, uh, the the grow Michel if I remember the name correctly, and that that is that is the banana from where the artificial uh, candy flavor is right. Like if, if you ever uh, tasted the the candy banana, I don't know if you have. And you yeah. taste it. it. It doesn't really yeah. taste like the banana that you are familiar with, but it does taste like the uh, the Gros Michel that is now no longer available on the market. Yeah, yeah. It's like I heard. It's like I heard some. some we, we, the wheat wheat now is different than we the wheat they parents ate in the fifties. Right. Anyways, well. anyways, everyone check out their links in the description. There was fungus that killed off the very and wine crop in the 19th century and the wine that's grown in Europe today in France uh, was from graphic and from California vines that had that were independent of it so that's how things can shift in the industry. yeah okay I got I, got, I didn't know if the wine from France is different from the wine in California yeah and technically no because it's all from California grapes from the oh. 19th century <laughs> Okay, guys, I, I, I really need to go now yeah, because yeah, it's, it's really late for me. So, yeah, me well, too. thank you for having us. Yeah, it's... thanks. Check out the link to the description below. No. Oh, hopefully, uh, it's actually going to be some sources I can put in the description too. But, anyways, never stop learning. Enjoy the random Yeah, and check out any of the technical papers that, that uh, Jackson drew on for a lot of those illustrations. Those would be perfect ones to put in the description for links. Yeah. Um. Okay. So I drew almost this entire thing from memory. <laughs> the pictures were just ones I found that were very uh useful on uh <laughs> on uh was it Google Images? But they're <laughs> I'm sorry. And the, it's just, it's the same pictures that are kind of, it's found in my textbook on uh, the game, but the game yeah puzzle, some uh, of those biology. were yeah some were Campbell yeah. biology pictures so yeah. yeah. We'll see y'all next time. Bye. All right.